Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So the global climate hasn't been this hot for a long, long time, and no, I'm not talking about quote unquote global warming. The ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict is well and truly over, with the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF, continuing to launch strikes on Gaza in order to defeat Islamic terrorist group Hamas. Now, some of the latest news to come out of the conflict is that, according to a leaked report from an off-the-record briefing for foreign journalists, Israel believes that 5,000 of the roughly 15,000 casualties reported by Hamas in Gaza were terrorists, not civilians. This, if true, is an historically low ratio of civilian to fighter deaths, as explained by Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus on CNN. Yeah, I can confirm the report, uh, and I can say that uh, if that is true, and I think that our numbers will um, be corroborated, if you compare though that ratio to any other conflict in urban terrain, between a military and a terrorist organization using civilians as their human shield and embedded in the civilian population, you will find that that ratio is tremendous, tremendously positive and perhaps unique in the world. He also confirmed, again, that Israel is in fact going to great lengths to avoid civilian casualties. I understand that there are civilian casualties and I understand that footage and coverage goes towards emotions uh, and to, to cover those civilian casualties. But what I want to say is that we will get those figures out and they will be official and on record by the IDF with the name behind it. And then we will be able to say uh, and to back up afterwards with names and numbers that we are indeed targeting the terrorists. We are not after the civilians and we're going into great efforts in order to keep it that way. And as we can see from this newly released footage from the IDF, it's been confirmed again that Hamas does indeed embed itself and its weapons in civilian areas, including, believe it or not, in kindergartens, in order to use the inevitable civilian casualties as anti-Israel propaganda. אנחנו נמצאים בעצם בשכונה אזרחית, בלב מקומות שנראים מקומות תמימים, כמו בתי ספר, גני ילדים, מוסדות חינוך, שבפועל מהווה מעוז למחבלים. אפשר לראות פה, בסמוך לאיתור, את בית ילדים, מרחב של נדנדות וקרוסלו, שזה נראה לנו על הנייר משהו כמו... משהו מאוד תמים ופשוט, ובפועל גם מפה התבצע ירי, מכל מיני מקומות שיצאו מהם פירים. כל השטח הזה הוא מהווה מערכת אחת של האויב שמתקשרים דרך התת קרקע אל כיוון הגנים ובתי הספר. אני רוצה להראות לכם פה את הכניסה לגן ילדים. נראה לנו כמו מקום תמים לחלוטין, שבפועל זאת עמדה לניהול לחימה. היה פה ממש חמ"ל בתוך המשרד של המנהלת, שבתוכו מנהלים לחימה ומפעילים פה את כל המערכת. ופה, ממש פה, במקום הזה, נמצאו אמצעי לחימה רבים. ועוד תשתיות של חמאס שממש עזרו להם להכין את כל המערכת שדיברתי עליה מקודם. Not to mention the increasing global outrage about the scale and the sheer cruelty of the sexual attacks used by Hamas terrorists on Israeli women during the October 7th massacre. But everyone, the conflict in the Middle East is not the only proverbial war on the block, so to speak. But before I elaborate on the absolute state of the world right now, I have an announcement to make. I am now appearing every week, twice a week on ADH TV. Your girl is hosting two shows a week and I will be bringing you not only the latest news from around the world, but also some of the most interesting people in it. I have put the link to my latest two shows in the video description and the pinned comment. Please, please give them a watch on your desktop or laptop. And also you can download the ADH TV app to your smartphone so you can watch me on demand whenever you want. And best of all, it is free to watch and to download. All you have to do is create an account. You will not be asked for any card details at any point and you will, all you need to get set up is an email address and then you have access to my shows, plus a bunch of other cool conservative TV shows, all totally for free. And in this economy, anything free is always good. So, back to the other war on the block. Step sideways to Europe and you'll find the Russia-Ukraine war is still going strong as it's about to enter its third year. Labelled a proxy war by some, the conflict has been propped up and prolonged by billions of dollars worth of foreign aid to Ukraine from countries like 
little old Australia, and of course, the USA. The latest on that front is that the White House has implored Congress to approve even more funding for the war in Europe to the tune of about 61 billion US dollars as part of an approximately US 105 billion dollar package that would also include funding for Israel's war against Hamas, US allies in the Pacific and money to house and process illegal immigrants along the Mexican border. Now, no extra funding has been provided for Ukraine since the Republicans took control of the House in 2022, and Speaker Mike Johnson has made it clear any new funding for Ukraine is dependent on the Republicans' demands being met for stronger controls at the U.S. southern border. He tweeted, The Biden administration has failed to substantively address any of my conference's legitimate concerns about the lack of a clear strategy in Ukraine, a path to resolving the conflict, or a plan for adequately ensuring accountability for aid provided by American taxpayers. Meanwhile, the administration is continually ignoring the catastrophe at our own border. House Republicans have resolved that any national security supplemental package must begin with our own border. We believe both issues can be agreed upon if Senate Democrats and the White House will negotiate reasonably. Now, needless to say, this attitude angers the warmongering neolibs within the Democratic Party, as revealed by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at a press conference. I want to ask a question about Ukraine. Are you saying that any member of Congress who votes against aid to Ukraine is voting for Putin? I believe that any member of Congress who does not support funding for Ukraine is voting for an outcome that will make it easier for Putin to prevail. That is, a vote against supporting Ukraine is a vote to improve Putin's strategic position. That's just an inescapable reality. That's not speaking to someone's motive, why they chose to vote against it. That's just speaking to the outcome of their vote. A vote against supplemental funding for Ukraine will hurt Ukraine and help Russia. It will hurt democracy and help dictators. Got that, Republicans? If you vote against throwing more money to prolong a fruitless conflict in Europe that's about as far removed from the USA as possible, you're hurting democracy. <laughs> Such hyperbole. Adding to global tensions is, of course, the Chinese Communist Party, which teeters continuously on the brink of launching military action to forcibly unify Taiwan with mainland China, as well as its continued attempts to destabilize the West through cyber attacks and online espionage. And that is before you get to the rise of BRICS, that is the acronym for the new alliance between Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, China and South Africa, as well as others, which seeks to challenge Western influence on global markets through trade and economic expansion. Now, as we've seen, these destabilizing global forces have caused a lot of civil unrest in Western countries over the past few months, especially the conflict in Gaza, which has unleashed a wave of global anti-Semitism not seen since the rise of what on this channel I like to call early 20th century German nationalists about 100 or 80 years ago. To cite just one example, we all remember this protest outside the Sydney Opera House in the wake of the October 7th attack. this kind of delusional misinformation being spread by white leftists on social media, which only serves to inflame tensions. Hamas is a political and military resistance group in Gaza, and they have been falsely labeled as a terrorist group. So I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone of a few of the resistance movements in America. I got this off of CSD.org. Seven times resistance changed American history, although I don't really need that <laughs> because I already know this history. But okay, the American Revolution, Civil War, the Women's Suffrage Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, and Black Lives Matter. Would you call any of those a terrorist organization? There's so much propaganda going around and misinformation. I really urge you to listen to Palestinian people who live in Gaza and the West Bank. Listen to them and their experiences and what they think about Hamas. Hamas is an organization that fights for the liberation of the Palestinian people. They are literally fighting against colonialism and white supremacy. If it was me, I'd be part of Hamas too. 
And the interesting thing about all of this is that during this rise in anti-Semitism perpetuated by Islamists and their Western sympathizers, right-wing populism had two massive wins. First, the new libertarian Argentinian president Javier Malay, who is adamantly pro-Israel, and then in the Netherlands when longtime politician and nationalist populist Gert Wilders won the recent Dutch election. Now he has long been outspoken on mass immigration in Europe, and in the wake of his victory, this speech went viral. Voorzitter, ten slotte heb ik nog een boodschap aan al die moslims in Nederland die onze vrijheid, onze democratie en onze kernwaarden niet respecteren. Die de regels van de Koran belangrijker vinden dan onze seculiere wetten. En dat zijn er veel. 700.000 blijkt uit het onderzoek van professor Koopmans. En mijn boodschap aan hen is wegwezen. Vertrek naar een islamitisch land. Dan kunt u genieten van islamitische regels. Dat zijn hun regels, maar niet de onze. Dit is ons land, niet uw land, maar ons Considering the diabolical behavior of the radical Islamists of Hamas on October 7th, not to mention the disgusting rhetoric of pro-Hamas protesters around the Western world, is it any wonder support for Gert Wilders surged? So let's assess the situation. War in Gaza, war in Ukraine, potential war in Taiwan, a rise in anti-Semitism, global civil unrest and fractures within politics, the likes of which haven't been seen since, well, the Second World War. With that in mind, I'm reminded of this tweet posted in October by social media commentator Keemstar. World War I started in 1914. World War I was only called World War I first in 1939. World War II started in 1939. World War II was only called World War II first in 1941. Has World War III already started? That is indeed the question. And I'm afraid that if we knew the answer, most of us really wouldn't like it. And if you want to see someone properly dissect just how close we may be to World War III right now, click the link in the video description and in the pinned comment to watch my incredible interview with the wonderful Jack Posobiec on ADH TV. I think you would all really enjoy it. If you like that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.